Our text this morning is going to be found in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. And while you're turning there, I'll just give you a little story. Uh, yesterday, I went to see if I could qualify with a handgun, and uh, I've only shot, in a, shot a pistol a couple of times in my life. And uh, I was out at the Lindsay's a couple of weeks ago practicing it, and I had a, a strange thing happen to me. I mean, I'd probably shot 50, 75, maybe even 100 rounds, and I was reloading my, my magazine, and I had, you know, I put my hand down here, and all of a sudden I found something nudge my hand. And I looked over there, and it's a little nub and buck. And I'm like, okay, you're obviously not the smartest deer in East Texas. And, but I'd already known about it. Lori had told me, don't shoot my little deer because they have a little pet deer that's out there. And lo- I think it thinks it's a dog, doesn't it? I mean, it, does it still hang with the dogs? Oh, yeah, right. They're illegal. I forget. Yeah, they don't have a pet deer. It's just on their property. And, uh, and you do have to give it away because they'll get really crazy next year. But I, I was there, and Wayne Elledge was there, Mike, and I... Um, that I only had one magazine. I'm borrowing Chase's gun, and I only have one magazine, and so they let I have to go first. And the whole class is watching, and I'm like, oh, this is just great. You know, I probably shot this thing twice in my life. And so these these guys, and then Wayne's going to jump in and go, and, and Wayne is ex-law enforcement, okay? So here I am, and, and on Chase's gun, the first pull is a long, long pull, if you know what that means. And so, you know, I'm thinking... I can do this. I can make this happen. And so I, and at the first one, you have five shots, and you have to, he says, shoot, and then you shoot, and then you wait for him to say it again. And, and so the first one, I'm like, I, I pull, and when I pulled, I pulled my gun down, and it was a miss. I didn't miss the target. I just lost a point. But I was like, oh, no. And all, you know, everybody's looking, standing around. I'm like, and they're all wondering what a preacher's doing at this class anyway. And and, and then I said, well, you know what? I don't care. I'm, I'm not going to get nervous. I'm not going to worry about this. And, you know, of course, Wayne, he he hits the bullseye. And I, I started to shoot him, and then I would have felt better. But I <laughs> probably wouldn't have been here today if I did that. But anyway, then I started shooting well, and I only lost one other point. Wayne beat me. He's the only guy in the class that beat me. He shot a 249. I shot a 248. I really should have shot him. So, But I I tell you that story to to let you know. They were asking me, what are you doing this for? I mean, I was like, well, I'll be honest with you. I'm looking for a hobby, you know. I I was playing golf for a while, and I said, you know, golf is is great, but it takes four hours, and I don't like to be gone for four hours. I can go shoot an hour or so and get back to doing what I need to do. And so they were, the whole deal was an opportunity for me to engage in an, an environment that I'd never been before, and I'm telling you, when I got there, I was a little disappointed because all of them were talking about their Sunday school class and their, their pastor, and I was like, well, this is not really what I wanted to hear from all you guys. I was hoping it'd be a bunch of lost people because when we, well, really, that's why I do a lot of my hobbies is, you know, because I could stay with you people all the time and never get to share Jesus, and I ask you to do that, so why shouldn't I? So I was a little bit disappointed in that, but, but we're, we're sitting in the class, and I'm listening to people, and I can hear different characters coming out and i want you to know there's a lot of paranoia in people who are you know in the concealed handgun arena um they they were all talking about how they almost got this or almost got that and i'm like all right i've been living 50 plus years and i've never noticed any of that i've never had any opportunity to think i would draw my gun and and one guy said i drew my gun yesterday at deerbrook mall i'm like oh my word (laughs) so I'm like, well, I'm not there yet, and I don't think I will be. But character is different. And when we look at the character of a disciple, we're in this Dare to Be a Disciple series, and I am asking you, I'm daring you to step out and be a disciple. To, to do the things that, that the world doesn't necessarily think is cool or okay. And for the most part, we can, we can be in East Texas and we can be a Christian and we can live out our life in mediocre Christianity and never really have anything bad happen to us. But what I'm asking you to look at today as we read these verses in Luke chapter 6 is to see that, that Jesus clearly spells out the character of a disciple. Uh, we know him as, as the Beatitudes. Um, and we, we will recognize them as such when we jump into them but it really is jesus outlining what the character of a disciple looks like let's read those verses together 
beginning in verse 20 of Luke chapter 6. Then looking up at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, because the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are hungry now, because you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. And blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note, your reward is great in heaven because this is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. But woe to you who are rich because you have received your comfort. Woe to you who are full now because you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, because you will mourn and weep. And woe to you when all people speak well of you, because this is the way their ancestors used to treat the false prophets. Now, these Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6 give us this great picture of the character of a disciple. And what I'm asking you to do today is to, to see, as we go through this, to see if your life reflects these characteristics. Now, you read these, and obviously you, you immediately think, well, I know these from somewhere else. And of course you do. They're the introduction to the uh, Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapter 5. And there are a lot of similarities between the two, and I want to go through those real briefly. These similarities involve the same audience. He's talking to the disciples. The same basic form. Every one of them has the word blessed are at the beginning and for in the transition. Each one of them have a reference to the kingdom of God in the first beatitude. The use of something called the divine passive, you will be satisfied, is in each, which means it's, a, it's God doing it and it's continual. Then there's a lot of shared material. Three of the four Luke and beatitudes are found in Matthew. The same concluding beatitude in Luke, which is verse 22, and then in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, uses a different um, uh, syntax when it has a second person plural, and each of the list of Beatitudes ends with the same idea that you should rejoice. So there's a lot of similarities to these, but also there are some dissimilarities that I want to talk about and specifically tell you why we're looking at Luke. First of all, the most striking difference is the number. Luke has four, and Matthew, of course, has eight. The second is that the order of the Beatitudes is also somewhat different. Luke's four Beatitudes appear as numbers one, four, two, and nine in Matthew. Matthew's Beatitudes are much more developed. You read that and you see. Luke's Beatitudes are followed by four corresponding woes, whereas Matthew's are not. And that's why I chose this today. Because for us to have a character of a disciple, I wanted you to see what happens when we don't have that character. And one of the most obvious and fun, if you look at these, is we know the Sermon on the Mount was Matthew's and that Luke's, as it says specifically, is on a level place. So... You look at this, and it, a lot of people say, well, is it the same sermon? Is it different? Is, or are, are the two um, just a, two different versions of the same thing? Well, and we can argue that and talk about that, but that's irrelevant. The key hermeneutical issue for us encountered in this passage revolves how to interpret those um, issues. And so that's what I want us to look at today, more important than the other stuff. Um, are, are the Beatitudes to be interpreted as requirements for entering God's kingdom? Or are they simply just some uh, encouragement, words of encouragement? In other words, uh, are they an evangelistic exhortation? You've got to have these in your life in order to be saved. Or are they something where God says, look, I want to encourage you because when you're experiencing these things, this is what's going to happen. Well, this, the latter is how we interpret these. And, and for a bunch of reasons, um, they're written to the disciples um, when Jesus, or they're spoken to the disciples, he's talking to the people who already believe in him. When we go to the Old Testament and we look in Psalms and, and a lot of other places where we have these sort of statements, blessed are you, uh, he, he's talking to the, the Old Testament saints, the, the nation of Israel. And so we believe that they are all about encouraging us. They, um, and that tells us that we should not take them as four separate things. When we look at these, we're not looking at them as this, this, and this. We're looking at them as, as a, a collective group of things that God's people should be about in their living and in their lives. And those are, those are some important things that, that I needed to, to cover before we actually got into them. And so what I want us to do, 
just going to be two simple points today. We're going to look at the character that leads to blessing and the character that leads to woe. First of all, in verses 20 through 23, there is this character that Jesus mentioned that leads to blessing. Every one of them, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed, blessed, blessed. And God wants us to know that. And so the first thing he says are blessed are the poor. Now, Matthew actually elaborates a little bit more on this, where he says poor in spirit and gives us a, a great idea of, of what's going on. So I want you to understand, when you read those in Luke, and a lot of people do, and say, oh, well, you've got to take a vow of poverty, and you can never have anything, and you, you, you can't be uh, materialistic, materialistically wealthy, all that's got to be going away. But the fact is that it doesn't mean that, that you must be poverty-stricken and financially poor. Um, hunger, nakedness, slums, are, they're not pleasing to God. Especially in this world of plenty that he has given us, he doesn't want us to be in any of those situations. Jesus is not talking about material poverty, and so many people look at that and say that, and they miss the main emphasis of what Jesus is trying to say. The, these are people who have nothing but God on whom to depend. Now, that may mean that you are in incredible poverty. But it may mean that you have much materially, but yet you still know that everything you have comes from God and you depend upon him. It is, it is that they realize that they have nothing of their own and, and they give to God and therefore they must depend upon his mercy. Whether God chooses to give back in this world or whether he chooses to give back materially in this world or, or emotionally or spiritually, that's the kind of people that Jesus is talking about here. The Old Testament term is used in Psalm 40 and in Psalm 86 and in Psalm 109 where the psalmist says, I am poor and needy. And we think about that and we say, okay, we hear that. But how, that helps us know that he's not talking about materialistic things because the guy who wrote those three psalms was David, King David. Now, none of us would claim, claim that King David is poor and needy materialistically, would we? So when he writes, I am poor and needy, even though he has wealth beyond any of our imagination, he's simply saying, I understand that my need for God is more than, than, than anything else. It, it would have been interpreted along the lines of, of the way we put it here and the way Matthew put it, that he's poor in spirit. So, so understand, that the first characteristic of a disciple is that they are poor in spirit. And it means that you understand that you can do nothing without God and that you have to have God in order for you to live like a disciple. Now, most of us would verbally agree with that, but then we, we don't live that way. And what I mean by that is that we don't seek God. We say, I can't make it without God, but then we get up immediately and, and, and go about our day. We, we don't ask God what we should do or how we should do that day. We just go about our business because we are not necessarily so poor and needy. And it's not a good place to be, and we'll talk about that briefly in, in the woes. The second thing that he says here about a disciple is that they are hungry now. Now, again, being hungry is not a blessing. There's nothing wrong with fasting. There's nothing wrong with setting aside that period of time where, where you abstain from food in order to seek God and say, hey, God, I, I want to seek you more than anything, even things that, that sustain life. Nothing wrong with that, but he's not talking about being hungry because oftentimes hunger is sad and, and tragic. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who hunger spiritually, who hunger after righteousness. It means to have a, a starving spirit, a, a spirit that craves righteousness. This is the life of a disciple, and this is what the Bible is daring us to live by, the idea that we crave after righteousness more than anything else in the world. In the Bible, righteousness means two simple but profound things. And it is only when we bring these two things together that we are practicing righteousness in a biblical manner. There are those who stress being righteous but neglect doing righteousness. And this leads to two serious errors. It leads to a false security. It causes a person to stress that he is saved and acceptable to God because he has believed in Jesus Christ. But he rejects and neglects the idea of doing good and living as he should. He 
He, he neglects obeying God, and he ab- neglects serving man. And I, I, and I have to compliment you. I, I know we don't have a, a lot, but we, Tina set up the um, angel tree, and I've had multiple families come and call and say, hey, where's the angel tree names? <laughs> well, they're gone. You know, if you don't get those things quick, you don't get them. And so I, I say that there are many of you who are doing just this, that you are not neglecting the serving man. Uh, it also can lead to loose living where we go and pretty much do what we say and, well, you know, I can just ask forgiveness later. And, and I hope that you have been here long enough to know that that's not the way a saved person lives. You don't live that way when, when you're trying to follow God. The problem with this stressing is that it's a false righteousness, and righteousness in the Bible means being righteous and doing righteousness. The Bible knows nothing about being righteous without righteous living. And it's not that you feel pressured to do that. It is that when you become righteous through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the disciple becomes hungry for righteousness, and you do them because God lives his life out through you. Most of us live in, in this between the spiritual and the flesh where we are trying our best to do what God wants us to do. When God says, I want you to hunger for righteousness, and when you do that, it changes everything. There are those who say, okay, I've been made righteous by the blood, but I don't worry about living righteous. The second group that I wanted to talk to you about is those who stress doing righteousness but neglect being righteous. And there are also two serious errors errors in this point of view. And first and foremost is self-righteousness and legalism. Causes a person to say that he is saved and acceptable to God because of what he does. That is a very dangerous place to be because Scripture is plain that none of us, none of us can make ourselves acceptable to God by what we do. The legalist neglects the basic law of love and acceptance. It is the idea that, that God loves him and accepts him not because he does good, but because he loves and trusts the righteousness of Christ. In our closing illustration, you'll hear a great example of that. Second error that that leads to is being judgmental. And that is that a person stresses that he is righteous and acceptable to God because he looks a certain way and he dresses a certain way and he acts a certain way and he believes that his way is the right way and everybody else is in trouble because they're not following the same way. The rules and regulations that he keeps, he feels like that everybody else ought to keep the same ones. When, to be quite honest, there are some things in Scripture that we could debate. And so, the legalist, the, the one who says, I'm going to practice righteousness but not be righteous, begins to condemn other people. And the problem is that it's a false righteousness as well. We, we say it again. The Bible tells us that it is being righteous and practicing righteousness is what Jesus is talking about here when he says you're hungry now. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. You want to do it and you want to be it. Now, Jesus does not say blessed are the righteous. Have you ever noticed that? In either Matthew or Luke, he doesn't say blessed are the righteous because none of us are righteous according to Romans chapter 3. And that goes back to the idea of we can never live to do anything to please God. So when we hunger after righteousness, it is a righteousness that comes only through Jesus. Man is not righteous. We can't be perfectly righteous. We have but one hope, and that is the righteousness that is imparted through Jesus Christ. And then that righteousness compels us to live righteously. And we have to hunger for that. God takes a man's hunger and thirst after righteousness and he counts that as righteousness. The promise to those who hunger and thirst after righteousness is that you'll be fulfilled. And that is important. We, and I'm talking believers here, we believers hunger and thirst after so many of the wrong things and we never find fulfillment but jesus promises look dare to be a disciple follow this let your character be that you hunger and thirst after righteousness and he promises that he will fill that for us 
The third thing that he says here is that we weep now. The character of a disciple is that he weeps. The idea is of a broken heart. A desperate, helpless weeping. It is, it is weeping over sin. It is weeping over the sin not only of, of your own, but it is weeping, weeping over the sin of the world. It is a broken heart over evil and suffering. That's the weeping that Jesus is talking about here. It's a brokenness that comes from seeing Jesus on the cross and recognizing that your hand had something to do with him being there. That's the weeping that Jesus is talking about here. And it, it, would, it would behoove all of us to occasionally consider that. That it, was, that it was my sin that sent Jesus to the cross. And each and every one of us need to take some time on occasion to sit down and to visualize that very thought. And if it doesn't bring weeping and mourning into your spirit, you need to talk to Jesus about your, your spiritual condition. He, he tells us that it's not people that, that walk around with tears in their eyes all the time. It, it is someone who experiences real pain because of what had to happen to our Savior. But, you know, Jesus says the end of the story is that good things are going to happen. He said... You know, if you're mourning now, you will laugh. And Revelation chapter 7 talks about that very thing where, where the Bible teaches us that, that Jesus will wipe away all the tears. We often say, there will be no tears in heaven, which is not biblical. But the Bible does say in Revelation 7, there, there is a period of time where they will end. The Bible says Jesus wipes away all of our tears. And it's of those who are mourning and weeping over their sin and over the, the state of the world and over the fact that their sin sent Jesus to the cross and we see him and he's beautiful and he walks up to us and he wipes away the tears. And we never have them again. Fourth characteristic that Jesus said, hey, this is what disciples look like. He said, you know, you're poor in spirit, you're hungry now, you're weeping, and then you're persecuted. Not necessarily our favorite one. Blessed are the persecuted. Really? What does that mean? Now let, let me clear this up. If, if you're just a mean person and people don't like you, that's not persecution. Jesus is very clear. It is those who are persecuted and endure suffering for the cause of Christ. That's the persecution that we're talking about. It's the persecution that says you are living your life in such a way that people recognize that you're living for Jesus and those who don't like him don't like you. He spelled out just what is meant by persecution. He said it means being hated, ostracized, reproached, and having one's name spoken against. That's what he said. He laid it out. But do you see the attitude? I mean, right after this, Jesus says, now here's the attitude that a person who is persecuted is supposed to have. He said, rejoice and leap for joy. The person who is hungering and thirsting after righteousness, the purchase, person who is mourning over the sin of the world and their own sin and recognizing that sent Jesus to the cross, and the person who is poor in spirit, recognizing that God is our only hope, can rejoice when people say bad things about them for the cause of Christ. Believers are forewarned that they will suffer persecution, not just here in John 15 and John 16, Philippians 1, 2 Timothy 3, 1 John 3, 1 Peter 4. All of these chapters teach us that Christians will be persecuted. And believers suffer persecution because we're not of this world. It's not because we're mean. It's not because we're intolerant. It's not because we're absolutely dogmatic. 
But it is because we are not of this world. We are, this is not our home yet. We are, we are separated, or we should be separated from the world by our behavior. Because we are so different, and because the Holy Spirit is in us, and changing us, and causing us to live out this righteousness, people are offended. And I want to tell you, you're going to offend people if you share your faith. It is offensive to walk up to somebody and say, you are wretched, and miserable, and blind, and poor, and naked. You are a sinner condemned to hell already because you don't believe in Jesus. That's going to bring about some conflict. Now, I don't suggest that that's how you introduce the gospel to someone, but it needs to be in there somewhere. It is very confrontational. And so some people don't like that. Most of them do. Most of them immediately agree in their spirit with what you're telling them because God's already working on them or else he wouldn't have sent you to them. And so it is, it is offensive to the world. And so we will suffer persecution because of that. We strip away the world's cloak of sin and we begin to reveal it and it hurts and it's painful and people don't like it. We suffer persecution because the world doesn't know God. They don't know Christ. They don't understand why we do what we do. We suffer persecution because the world is deceived in its concept and its belief of God. Man's idea, and you know this as well as I do if you're in the world, man's idea of God is that of some, some supreme grandfather. He protects, he provides, and he gives, no matter one's behavior, just so the behavior is not too far out. This supreme grandfather will accept and work all things out in the final analysis. But the true believer says that's not the way it works. The true believer says, look, we've got to be poor in spirit, and we're living that. We've got to be hungry for righteousness, and we're living out an imparted righteousness and an obedient righteousness. And then the world doesn't like that anymore. These four things that Jesus says are, are characteristics of a disciple that lead to blessedness. But, but Jesus goes on, and Luke records this, about a character of people, maybe even those who call themselves disciples, that lead to woe. And I hope you don't find yourself in here. First of all, he, he, he talks about the rich. Now, the meaning of, of woe and rich must be understood in the, light of meaning, uh, in the light of the meaning of blessed and poor in verse 20 that we went to. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are rich economically. But honestly, most people in this category of woefulness are rich economically. But it really denotes the arrogant, the haughty. According to Proverbs 28, 11, it says, A rich man is wise in his own eyes, but a poor man who has discernment sees through him. It denotes dishonesty in gaining that wealth. Again, back to Proverbs 28, better a poor man who lives with integrity than a rich man who distorts right and wrong. But what it's trying to convey here is those who don't listen to instruction when they're confronted about their methods of gaining wealth or about how true wealth is gained in the form of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 32 speaks of those who are complacent to the words of the prophets. And it, and it talks about when a prophet comes in and confronts you and you don't respond, then, then you are rich. You think you are rich. You think you are okay. And I go back to that Revelation passage that I quoted a minute ago talking about confronting people where the Bible says you say that you are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, but you don't even know that you are blind and naked and miserable and poor and wretched. And that Jesus says, I stand outside the door and knock. He says, I'm not even in there. You who think you have it all together, you who think your life is good, we're not talking about just money. We're talking spiritually. When we start thinking our life is together, then we become a rich person. And God says, you're going to get what you want. You've already received your comfort. And it's not an eternal comfort. It's the comfort that you think you're doing okay here. And Jesus says to those people, I am standing outside the door and I am knocking. I am not even in your heart. I am knocking on the door of your heart trying to get in. That's what he means by the rich 
and the woe of the rich. And he said, woe to those who are full now. Those who have everything that this world offers. They lack nothing. Their material possessions become their financial security. And because of that, it causes them to think that they have no need for God. Again, it is when these material things begin to take precedent over God that the Bible says, woe to you. The Bible says one day you're going to be hungry. It may not occur in this lifetime. You may fill your bank account all your life. But then when the end comes of this life, you will begin to suffer. Then he talks about laughing now. Woe to those who are laughing now. And Jesus is not against laughter. The Bible talks about how, uh, you know, laughter is, is great medicine and merry heart doeth a man good. And, and, and all of these things, God says, look, I want you to be happy. He wants us to be joyful and we can be happy as well. But it's really more Jesus pointing at the same attitude carried by those who are rich and self-satisfied in this life. And they kind of give a superficial laughter when, you know, when you go to them and talk to them about God. Like, <laughs> you know. I don't really care about that. They just, they just take it as nonsense. That's what Jesus is talking about. But they're going to find that they're wrong. And they will mourn and weep forever is the, is the concept that he's trying to say. Look, you want to laugh in the face of God? You want to think this is a, a joke for the, for the people who have minor intellect? They don't, they're not real smart. You want to be comical about that? You think it's kind of cute that all these dumb people are following Jesus? Then, then great. You enjoy your laughter now. Because you will mourn and you will weep. It's, it's those people who have no sense of sin. And they're laughing, uh, laughing it up with the world and all of its comfort and ease. And they pay no attention to the reality of God in this, in this world. And the fourth thing, again, the woe is the opposite of the first one. All who speak well of you. It's opposite of those who are persecuted for Christ's sake. It's those who who are so interested in what the world thinks about them that they would rather make men happy and, and they would rather be a people pleaser than they would a God pleaser. And their life is that. And we don't just see this in the meek and the mild. And you know that often comes to mind where it's that person who, who just is such a people pleaser that they, they can't do anything. It, it could be very powerful people who have risen to power by trying to not make anybody mad. The worldly speak well of those who live worldly, who live as they live, who speak as they speak, who compromise, who seek their company and approval, who never point out the truth of sin and death and of judgment and hell. And there are people who rise to power by doing just that. And there was a group in the Old Testament who actually did this. They rose to power by just saying what people wanted to hear. They were called false prophets, and Jesus mentions them here. They were praised by kings and crowds because of their predictions. They always predicted personal prosperity. They always predicted victory in war. And so people began to, to see that, hey, these guys are great. And, and, and some of their prophecies may have been predictions way on down the road, and so they weren't stoned immediately. But then what we know happened is that the nation of Israel is completely conquered and all these false prophets are standing there predicting that, oh, it's going to be okay. Oh, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to have everything. God wants you to be incredibly blessed as the world sees it. Don't worry about anything. And all of a sudden, they're overrun and sent into exile. And Jerusalem is destroyed and the temple is desecrated. Worldly men want attention. And they want esteem. And they want position. And they want place. And so these false prophets use the good words to get there. But Jesus said that the false prophets were those of whom the world spoke well, but that was their only reward. And if you're looking for people to talk good about you, enjoy it, because that's all you're going to get. Nothing in the next world. It was an early church father by the name of Jerome. And he actually was the one that put together the Latin Bible. We call it the Vulgate. Many of you know that, or the common Bible, because most people could read Latin. And he gives us an idea about how all of this 
comes to be when we're looking at daring to be a disciple. He had a dream. And in his dream, Jesus visited him. And when Jesus came to visit him, Jerome immediately, in his dream, went and collected all of his money, all of it. And he brought it to Jesus, and he laid it at his feet. And Jesus said, I don't want your money. So he took all of his money away, and he went and got all of his possessions, everything that he had in his dream, and he brought these possessions, and he laid them again at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said, I don't want your possessions. And Jerome said to Jesus, then, Lord, what is it that you want? And Jesus looked at Jerome and he said, I want you to bring me all your sin. I want you to bring me all the junk in your life. Jerome said he was never the same after that dream. And I tell you that because as we read this and the Bible says, you know, you shouldn't be rich and you should be hungry. You should be poor in spirit and and you shouldn't laugh now. We we interpret that wrong. Jesus is saying, I don't want any of your stuff. It's all mine anyway. I created it all. And he is the only religious leader who ever said, bring me your sin. Everybody else says, bring me your stuff. Jesus said, bring me your sin. And in order for you to be a disciple, that's what you have to do. That poor in spirit is an incredible place to be. To recognize, I don't care how good you get. I don't care how many people you've won to faith in Christ. I don't care how many people you disciple throughout your years. It is that you always recognize that you are poor in spirit and that Jesus doesn't want your stuff. He wants your sin. I know that many, most of you in this place have have made some commitment to Jesus. But I also believe that many, maybe even most of us, we do not dare to be a disciple. Oh, We would never stand up and say, I am going to be a false prophet so that people will like me. But by the same token, we don't go to the other extreme and say, I'm going to follow the pattern of Jesus and point out the world is lost without him. That's what he wants us to do. And so we sit there and we begin to feel guilty and we think, you know, I, I, I'm not a disciple. What do I do here? How do I, how, how do I do this? And the whole idea comes to us in that dream that Jerome conveyed in his book. And that is, Jesus says, I don't, I don't want your good stuff. Use that for my glory. I want your sin. Who wants to give that to him today? Jesus is in this place. Oh, it's not a dream. He's not physically here, but spiritually through his spirit, he is here and he is saying to you, bring me your bad stuff. I want to take care of it.